any better? Good morning. Welcome to 1160 AM KBDT News Talk Sports. Tune in this afternoon from 2 to 5 p.m. for all the news, commentary, and debate that you might have missed in the morning. John David Wells on the Wells Report brings it to you live right here on 1160 AM KBDT News Talk Sports. Currently 834, mostly sunny and hot today, high of 94. That's right, you heard me right, high of 94. And if you didn't get that, how about this? 94, that's right, 94 degrees in Espanol. That means it's going to be hot, super hot, caliente hot, sweating hot, bad. All right, mild again tonight, though, low of 69, currently 73 degrees here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And the sun is out and the sky looks good. Excited here, very, very excited about what we're getting ready to jump into with the mental health moment. Again, we want to thank Chris Getz at Acadia Healthcare uh, for all that they have done to make sure that we can continue to bring the message to the people that there's nothing to be afraid of when it comes to your mental health, and there's no reason for you not to reach out. So reach out to Acadia Healthcare, 469-400-7499. All right, we've got Patty with us and Steve this morning. Good morning, both of you. Good morning, John. Good morning, John, Kat, Kathy, and the crew. Well, of course, poor Kathy, she is out with allergies this morning. Uh, she Ooh, had to do breathing okay. treatments last night and did not get to sleep probably till about 5.30 this morning. So she will not be with us this morning. Um, but the, both Patty and Steve are with the Morgan Foundation and Something for Kelly Foundation. And you guys have brought a fantastic guest. I mean, May, first of all, is just packed full of heavyweight champions. And today is no less. Uh, and so, Patty, Steve, who do we have this morning? Good morning, John. Yes, we are so honored and excited to welcome Dr. Michael. I'm going to let you pronounce your last name. We've had a discussion over it. Is it Genovese or Genovese? <laughs> Genovese is uh, the easiest Genovese. way to say it. Genovese. Genovese. Yes. Okay, I was wrong on yes. both. <laughs> Doctor, you also have a law degree. Please tell us about your background. Tell us about where you work and give us a little bit of information so we know what your qualifications are to visit with us this morning. Oh, yes. So, yeah, I do. Uh, I, I felt like I didn't have enough student loan debt, so I went back <laughs> to medical school after, after law school, and now I am the chief medical officer at Acadia Healthcare. Um, got about 585 uh, facilities uh, where we treat people for all sorts of uh, conditions, depression, anxiety, uh, mental health disorders, um, substance use disorders, uh, all around the country in the UK. So, Doctor, how has all of this changed and or expanded in this calendar year of everything we're going through right now? This has been quite a calendar year, hasn't it? Um, so, there has been a so everything that's been going on has uh, done a lot to crystallize what our place in the overall healthcare system is and and where we fit in and and, and uh, it's been important for us to support our colleagues uh, in med surge hospitals who are uh, addressing you know uh, COVID nineteen and the respiratory disease that people have um, and there are no elective psychiatric emergencies um, and and mental health care uh, continues to be an issue in the country. So as uh, they've needed to devote their resources to um, addressing the respiratory illness, we've needed to step up and support them uh, and take the patients who needed our care uh, and work in coordination with them so that the whole health care system can continue to work as it's supposed to. Doctor, you mentioned the other day about something that most people probably don't think about, the situation that mental health care providers find themselves in. I believe that you said they didn't sign up for this. Um, Firefighters and police officers kind of know the risk they're going to be putting themselves in. Talk a little bit about the mental health of the people that are providing these services. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting situation. Um, when you when you choose your specialty, you choose it for various reasons, but people generally going into psychiatry 
have somewhat of an, of an idea in their head of what they're going to be treating, they don't necessarily think that they're going to be on the front lines of an infectious disease battle. And you, we have patients in our hospitals suffering uh, with COVID, um, and we have uh, psychiatric providers wearing full PPE, going in every day to take care of their patients. Um, it can be stressful. It's not something that people anticipated. Uh, I've been I'm constantly amazed and impressed by our staff who have been thrown this huge curveball uh, and never saw themselves as uh, tr- having to be in this acute medical situation, um, but have stepped up and continue to keep, treat patients with care and compassion and diligence. Um, and they do it every day. Um, they're able to compartmentalize, get in there and do their job. But I can tell you for, for the our um, staff, the doctors, the nurses, the techs, it can be traumatizing just as it can be for the entire medical community. I mean, this is a, a collective trauma that we're all going through together. Um, and um, I think that it's easy for people to overlook the fact that people in the medical profession are people too and are experiencing this um, in real time, just like everybody else. Do- uh, doctor, along those lines, because our medical providers, nurses, and counselors are seeing more firsthand the the, the trauma that exists, the the, the the horrific impact that COVID-19 does have, what are you seeing more in terms of the mental health needs of those who are providing that type of care to uh, others? You know, I think that, so we talk about post-traumatic stress, and you've probably heard the term post-traumatic stress disorder, um, and I don't call it that. I will call it post-traumatic stress injury. Um, And I do that for several reasons. One, uh, because if you tell people they have a disorder, it kind of turns them off. Two, it's not really a disorder. It's it's a a justifiable reaction to, um, to a situation that's unbelievable. Um, And the other thing about when you call it injury, you can heal from injuries. And I think that that's the good news. So people are traumatized, and they are experiencing some of the effects of of post-traumatic stress. But the good thing about the brain is that it is changeable. We talk about neuroplasticity. So as as people are experiencing some of these things, some of the anxiety, some of um, the, the, the mood issues, some of the nightmares, the things that go along with that, what I try to get out there is there are things that we can do. We can build resilience. We can treat the um, the disease. We can treat the symptoms, and people can get better. And that's the important message to get out there to them. So in, in general, how have your medical staff responded to the concerns that we have here? So um, you mean in terms of have they been – displaying any symptoms or have they been reaching out for help and that sort of yeah Yeah. i I was particularly uh, touched with what you said the other day that it's it's an issue for them that they never anticipated when they became um psychiatrists yeah you know uh so i've been getting calls from people i think that they sort of have to uh almost lead a dual life at this point they when they're at the hospital they're dealing with patients and and they are you know then they have to call family members and they have to be very professional when they sort of take off that professional hat and sometimes they'll call me on the phone and they'll say my, my I never saw myself doing this and I'm, they're you know they're going through this the same way we all are and they we don't have all the answers right now and they are you know uh, sometimes afraid uh, of, yeah. you know, uh, getting it themselves, bringing it home to them, their families. Um, so I, I think that they're justifiably nervous about what's going on, um, but there's that inner drive. I, I think that people generally go into medicine for a reason. I, I still think it's more of a calling than a job. Uh, so they are they're going in, they're doing their jobs uh, beautifully, um, but some of them are, you know, uh, feeling some of these, um, the fears 
uh, and it can affect sleep and it can affect mood and energy and all the things that you think of um, so, when so facing doctor, a crisis like this. Are, are you setting up additional resources other than yourself being available for them to call you and say, Mike, I'm not prepared for this? What, what are we doing here? What should we be doing for the staff of the medical community? Oh, yeah. Well, we, we certainly do. We have, um, we have set up um, hotlines for all of our staff. They can call. We have people here that they can speak with at any time. Um, and, and, and hospital systems throughout the country, I think, are doing that. And if they're not, you know, they certainly should be. We should be recognizing that the people on the front lines uh, need our help uh, as much as, as anybody else. So we do. We have staff who are devoted to, to being there for them, to listening to them. Um, we've tried to give people as much support as they need uh, so that they can come through this in a healthy way. Right, right. So do hospitals uh, communicate with each other about best practices such as this? I, I'm, I'm particularly touched by the medical community that are so strong in a manner in which they were totally ill-prepared or certainly didn't plan for. They, they certainly have been. You know, and it's amazing. We've had hospitals who, you know, we're psychiatric facilities, you know, so we're somewhat prepared for some of this sort of thing. We had some PPE. Um, but like most places, uh, a lot of hospitals, you know, no one was anticipating the need for as many masks and gloves and gowns as we needed. Um, I have seen facilities that we have in one part of the country overnight, all of the PPE that they had to facilities that were in hot spots that needed it and pulled together and acted um, to be supportive, and actually that's one of the beautiful things that have come out, if there's anything that you can say positive about what's been going on, is seeing people uh, respond to other people's needs and doing their best to help and calling, and, and a hospital that had been through a crisis, um, having their staff call another hospital who's going through it subsequently to help them and say, hey, listen, here's what we experienced, here's what we learned, here's what you can take away from it, so that we're not constantly recreating the wheel. And it's also, I think, really helpful to speak to someone who's been through it before so that you know that, okay, it can happen, and here's what you do during it, and then you can come out on the other side. I think that's uh, really important and necessary. Doctor, we've also seen a spike in, uh, in sub uh, substance use disorder orders and and yeah. alcohol abuse with people who are sh uh, sheltered in home how you know how is that being addressed now yeah you make a really good point when people are isolated um, and you know for example they can't go to their their meetings they're not seeing a therapist regularly um, and they're feeling lonely, which is different than being alone. Feeling lonely is painful. They're feeling isolated. It's easy to fall back on what you knew. And what they knew previously was using substances to numb that pain. So we are seeing some people who um, have fallen back into those habits. They're presenting through different means. We're using telemedicine to try to get to people. Uh, we have crisis lines. I think you gave out a number before. People can call to get the help that they need. We're still treating patients. Um, we are reaching out to people. There are actually some people, I will say, who have utilized this time where, you know, they can't go to work, they can't do other things, to s take a look at themselves who had been using already and utilizing this time to get into recovery. Um, so in that way, you know, we are reaching some people. So we need to reach out to people. We need to encourage our loved ones to get help if they need it now. This uh, stress makes every other symptom worse than it was before. So um, we should be approaching people in a non-blaming, non-shaming way and encouraging them to get help if they need it, especially during these stressful times. Doctor, so as we encourage people to reach out and get help, We've discussed this tsunami of insurance claims that are going to be coming at us. 
we might want to speak a bit about that or take that one into the break when we um, get through, whatever works better okay, for sure. you, because we just have a few seconds that left. Sounds, that sounds great. Well, we'll go ahead and take that into the break. Of course, our social media is always on and always active. You can go to JP, Kathy, and the crew on Facebook, and you can catch the conversation because we continue the conversation as we go through the segment because the information is so important and Sadly, on radio, we only have so much time. And so uh, we're here with the Mental Health Moment again, brought to you by Acadia Healthcare. Don't suffer another minute. Reach out for peace of mind. Contact Chris Getz at 469-400-7499. We'll be right back with Dr. Michael Genovese and Patty and Steve here on the Mental Health Moment on 1160 AM KBDT News Talk Sports. Um, Steve and Patty, are you guys watching the feed as well? I am not. I don't have access right now. I am not either, sir. Okay, just real quick before Dr. Uh, Genevieve answers that question, uh, Cleo put on there, my field can be extremely emotionally draining. New mothers are often dramatized by a bad birth experience, unplanned C-section, medical complications, and then breastfeeding has gone wrong. They need emotional support on top of lactation help. Uh, She's a lactation expert, Dr. Genevieve, and uh, goes out and helps moms learn how to breastfeed. And so very, very stressful there as well, I imagine. I think that everybody, um, everybody that, that, that's a stressful job to start with, and it sounds like uh, now, given the current circumstances, would be exponentially more. So didn't mean to break up there, but go ahead, and um, Patty, let's continue the conversation. No, I think that's a very important uh, comment to make, so not, not a problem at all. Well appointed. So, Doctor, we were visiting on the way into the break about the fact that there are so many more claims that are going to be coming. In fact, this is the next pandemic, and I don't think it's on the way. I think it's actually here. So do you have some thoughts around how they might handle these incoming claims? Yeah, so I I think that you're right. I think that is the next pandemic. I think that there's been a lot of pent-up need that's going to um, manifest itself here um, going forward. And I think you're right. I think we're starting to see it already as as some of the states are opening up. We're seeing some more people uh, come and seeking help. One of the problems, to your point, was that people were avoiding, um, for example, some of the places they would go initially for help, like the emergency room, for fear of contracting the virus. Even people with chest pain were avoiding the emergency room. Now people are feeling free to go out and uh, and look for help. And I think that we um, we have done a good job of, of communicating with each other and trying to be ready um, and be ready for an influx of not just the amount of people but the complexity of what's going on because we have people with uh, new symptoms. We have people with um, previously existing, say, anxiety who have it's now been exacerbated. They have anxiety and now have been using substances to um, try to address it. So we need to be ready for complex patients, people who are coming in complaining of depression with an overlaying opioid use disorder, uh, uh, with anxiety, with all sorts of things. So um, right now, communication among different services is going to be really important. Triaging is going to be really important. And um, having our, keeping our, our doctors and nurses and techs healthy so that they can handle the influx One is going to be really important. Dr. Wynn, when we come back on air, we're, we're, you know, we really tried to end the show with giving uh, hope. So we're going to be asking you, you know, what can people do in terms of resi- resiliency or seeking hope or, you know, how to address the uh, stigma that does still exist. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's important that we end giving some hope. And, of course, feel free, you know, sure. we'll, we'll want you to give email addresses out and contact information, for, you know, for the entire chain of uh, uh, entities that you have, of course. Okay. Um, and may briefly, if we have time, mention that they're about, and we don't.
Good morning. Welcome back to 1160 AM. KBDT News Talk Sports. Currently 854. Mostly sunny and hot today. High of 94. Mild again tonight. A low of 69. Currently 73 degrees. Cannot thank Chris Getz and Acadia Healthcare for their sponsorship of the Mental Health Moment. Don't suffer another minute. Reach out for peace of mind. Contact Chris at 469 469- Four zero zero seven four nine nine. All right, we've got Dr. Michael Genovese joining us from Nashville, Tennessee, both medical doctor and an attorney. We've got Patty Giolet, and we've got Steve Dunn, both with the Morgan Foundation and Something for Kelly Foundation. And we want to thank them for bringing such an awesome guest on from Nashville. And we're going to turn it back over to the two of you and let us get into uh, how we can fix things. How can we get things better? Again, thank you so so, so much. We, you know, we know this is a very serious I- issue because right now in Congress there are 462 bills that m- mention COVID-19. Only one mentions mental health, and that bill is asking the director of the, N- of the NIMH to conduct research into the mental health impact of COVID-19 on health care providers and allocates $100 million per year for the next five years years for that. So we know that this is such a serious I- I issue at this time. But, Doctor, give uh, give us some hope for, you know, for the people out there and as well as the health care provi- providers. Where do you see the industry going from this point on? Well, here's the good news. There is hope. Um, a previous Surgeon General had uh, written a report about this and pointed out rightly that Things like substance use disorders, depression, anxiety, these aren't moral failings or weaknesses. These are um, pathology of the brain that we can address. We've come a really long way in terms of uh, neuroscience. We have ways of uh, treating pre-existing disease. We do trainings for resilience. Um, We help people become more resilient so they can spring back from adversity and be even healthier afterwards. Um, so to the extent that people are suffering, we have good therapeutics. We have great modalities of treating people, and people get better. Uh, so the biggest problem is overcoming the stigma of asking for help. There are a lot of people out there who are very eager to help others who are slow to look for help for themselves. Um, so one of the best things that you can do is just encourage people to get the help that they needed. If, if you had somebody, a family member who was suffering with upset stomach or with chest pains, you would, you would encourage them to go see the doctor. Same thing for emotional pain. You should be encouraging them to go get the help that they need because there's a lot that we can do. So, Doctor, what is, a be- what is the best way, in your opinion, to address the stigma that still, addressed, uh, that, that still exists regarding people who seek mental health care? You know, I think that we, I talk to people about it in biologic terms because the brain's a complex organ, but it's an organ just like the heart, the lungs, or the kidney, and it gets sick. Uh, it's just that we haven't understood it for a very long time. We've probably made more progress in neuroscience in the past 10 years than we did in the previous 100. Um, and so now just getting it out there and talking about it and validating it and, and, and not blaming people for it um, or, you know, questioning, um, you know, why you can't get over it. Uh, you would never tell someone don't have chest pain. So you don't tell people don't have anxiety. What you say is, hey, you should go get help for that. And there's lots of ways. Um, and sometimes it, it's as easy as giving a phone number. We have a hotline that people can call, and they can talk to somebody, and they can figure out um, what the best way for them to proceed is. Um, and I can actually I can give that to you if, if that's okay. Sure. Um, yeah. There's a number. If you call 833-873-2824, I'll give that one more time, 833-873-2824. You'll get someone who's trained and can help you find the help that you need. All right. Can't thank Patty and Steve. Can't thank you enough. Dr. Genovese, thank you so much for accepting their invitation and being a part of the mental health moment today. 
Thank you for having me. All right. So, Patty and Steve, we've got the conversation, and we're going to keep going uh, as we uh, get out of the out of the break here and uh, end JP, Kathy, and the crew for today. So, uh, stay tuned on JP, Kathy, and the crew on Facebook and pick up some more words of wisdom from Dr. Michael Genovese and Patty and Steve here at the Mental Health Moment. Again, want to thank our dear friend Chris Getz at Acadia Healthcare for all that they have done to support the Mental Health Moment. Have a blessed day. Gary Sinise tomorrow from 7.30 to 7.40. Talk to you tomorrow. Okie dokie. Steve and Patty, you're back on. Doctor, again, thank you so much. You know, we're we're going to talk to you on five or six more minutes, perhaps at the most, just trying to wrap things up. Um, or is there anything that you would you know like to get out at this point that we have not addressed yet? Because uh, we're still on Facebook Live, and we're going to pull the feed down and uh, have it up on a YouTube channel and be able to distribute this through your uh, email system and ours as well, hopefully to get the uh, most information out to the most amount of folks out there. Sure. Um, um, let me think what would be the most important thing that we haven't talked about yet. You know, I think that we've talked about, you know, people and overcoming the stigma, and I think that maybe we can reinforce that first responders are going to need uh, some sort of help or... Um, geez, I mean, there's so much stuff. Is there anything in particular that you would want to address? No, you know, I know in the past we have emphasized the need for, uh, you know, we go in every year to have uh, pre- prevent- preventive care. We see our general practitioner and the blood tester done and all that. We are trying mm-hmm. to push the idea of having ba- basically a mental health uh, care ch- uh, checkup as a means of, of having preventive care. Is that something that your organiz- organization embraces or, or strongly oh, recommends that sure. you know, their empl- yeah. you know, your employees just go out and have a, a mental health che- uh, checkup? Absolutely. And people can even start with their primary care doctor. Um, they're getting training in um, what they, what, you know, these brief sort of evaluations and then referral to treatment. Um, and we have relationships with all of these doctors. So if it's um, difficult for people to say, hey, I'm going to go see a psychiatrist right away, you can just reach out to your primary care doctor, um, and we can talk about, listen, the United States is not great at preventative care. Um, I think that we spend more money than any other country in the world, but we're about 34th in terms of um, how old we live to be. So we really need to get on that. Um, preventative part of medicine. So we could certainly talk about that. And, 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 and behavioral health affects physical health. So we can certainly talk about that. Now, in the past few b- months, have you seen a change at all in the manner in which insurance companies are uh, reviewing claims, paying claims? Have you seen that they're, a little, they're more receptive to the mental health care claims being made, or is that still just a long work in progress? Um, it, I think that it's, you know, they have not created a problem. I think that they're recognizing that this has, uh, is, is triggering things for people, um, and it's probably smarter to address it now than let it turn into a big problem later. Um, you know, if you you could you know let get some people get some treatment now, or you could pay for an ICU bed uh, later if it goes poorly. I don't know if that's uh, that's pretty heavy to get into, but that's um, it's. Yes. I think that they're they're being smart in recognizing that there are real issues that are people are, are are facing right now. You know, just you know, in in fact, you know, our guest last week, uh, Brian. <laughs> Hufford, he's one of the lead attorneys in the Witt case, talked about how some insurance providers are beginning to um, open up the purse strings a little bit more, but of course we still have a long way to go, and I think through a good collaboration of attorneys and doctors and politicians, that, that might be the be- best way to you know, address this issue, of course, and mm-hmm. hopefully we get to a point where where mental health care is 
more affordable, more avail- available, and not stigmatized at, at all. Yeah, well, when you think about it from the insurance perspective, uh, behavioral health has an impact on heart disease, diabetes, all sorts of other things. So even if you're just looking at it in terms of dollars and cents, it makes more sense to address the behavioral health because you can have better outcomes in terms of everything else that you're doing, pulmonary disease, renal disease, everything else. Patients do better if, um, if their behavioral health is addressed. Absolutely. Uh, Patty? I, I like ending it on that note because I think we could do a show further down the line about how behavioral health impacts your medical condition. I think if more people sure. understood that connection, I think we could enlighten some souls and hopefully get that claims process a little bit more improved as well. Okay, sure. So why don't we talk about that? <laughs> All right. We'll bring, that, we'll bring you back, good doctor, and we'll, okay. we'll talk about that subject then. But we really appreciate you joining us this morning. You really have given us a great amount of information. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. You guys are great to speak with. Yeah, thank you, Dr. And Genevieve. Thank you so much. And you guys be safe out there in Nashville. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, JP, next week uh, to end Mental Health Awareness M- Month, we have Congressman Van T- Taylor. Yep. Who's going, who's going to talk to us about mental health care, uh, the system, and what we can do to perhaps push through laws that will help so many people with their mental health care needs. So looking for, forward to next week. JP, as always, thank you. Doctor, if you're still on the air, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to next week. All right. Sounds good. Patty, Steve, take care of you. Thank you, JP. Have a good one. All right, you guys too. Take care, Doctor. Bye. All right, end.